All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, I admit today that I feel inadequate to uh, help present the glories of your word. Um, I think, thank you for the simplicity of your revelation and at the same time the um, incredible artistry. Um, I uh, thank you for the gentleness with which you reveal um, to us our sin. And I confess that probably we don't know the half of or even the smallest fraction of how offensive our sin is to you. And um, I'm sure we don't know the smallest portion of your grace uh, to deal with our sin. Um, and so I pray that you help me as a teacher uh, today to uh, not get in the way of your word. But I pray that your word would be a means of grace um, in the cacophony of voices who um, scream out today, listen to me, listen to me. I pray that you would give us the grace of your spirit to listen to your word. Um, help us today as we look at your word and um, use even something as simple as a college class to uh, be a means of grace to transform our lives. I pray that when we leave this room that we'll never be the same. Um, and Father, we make this prayer, I make this prayer, not claiming any inherent superiority uh, to anyone. Uh, I cannot uh, accuse anyone else of sin, but uh, I do confess my own sin and say, uh, uh, according to Jesus' words, um, as he instructed me, O oh God, be made merciful to me, the sinner. Um, I pray that having seen that truth, that you would also fill us with the the confidence that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And that when that day comes, that you'll describe all of us in Christ as just men and women having been made perfect. Would you do that work in our lives today? For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we are looking at um, a very interesting thing today, a very artistic thing today, um, and maybe a thing you've never seen before, but um, the, the kind of jumping off place is that there's a connection between the giving of the Ten Commandments and the creation of Genesis 1, that just as God created, uh, just as God gave 10 words at Mount Sinai, uh, so too he created the world with 10 words. And a lot of people believe that what's going on there is that somehow the whole universe is God's temple and that God is setting up kind of his instruction for life in that temple. And as we look at that, there's kind of a decreation of the world with the ten plagues. And so there's this art, uh, artistic thing that's happening in Genesis 1. And it may be making an incredibly beautiful um Point, and I, I want to try to help us see that uh, today. Um, before we jump in, if you could take attendance quiz uh, five. Uh, sorry, I should have uh, uh, changed that. Attendance quiz five in Brightspace uh, today. 
And as always, I uh, want to give an opportunity for someone to introduce themselves, and young man volunteered, and so uh, if you'll come. Shaken actually uh, biblical name. Uh, 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 shaken actually found some scrolls, took them to King Josiah and read them, and doing that uh, they rebuilt Jerusalem. And uh, actually, one of my closest friends slash roommate here at Bryan is uh, Adrian Josiah. Yeah. Oh wow, that that's very good. And uh, Fayetteville, that's near Atlanta. Some. Oh, yeah, so south of Atlanta. Uh, so have you lived in Fayetteville all your life? And do you say it Fayetteville or Fayetteville? Which way do you say it? Fayetteville. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, it's nice for me an opportunity to connect names and faces. So thank you all for... Uh, being willing to do that. Want to try something in a big class? Uh, I don't know if this will work or not. Uh, but did you find anything interesting in the homework? Um, remember, I'm bribing you with extra credit points, uh, you know, if you'll talk in class. Any, anyone find anything interesting in the homework? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, I've got a slide there where, uh, so great question, um, what, you know, how, how do you know there are 10 words? Well, I'm going to put up a slide, and we're going to see that there's this phrase in the Hebrew that's exactly the same 10 times. And so even though it's it's seven days, in those seven days, 10 times God says, uh, Vayomer Elohim, you know, and God said, let there be light, and God said, let there be a Rikia, and God said, let, so uh, when we look at that, like there are 10 words, and so a lot of ancient interpreters say, oh, they call the Ten Commandments the 10 words, and so is there some connection there? Um, and, and it's interesting to me that, you know, if there is a connection, let's say there is a connection, you know, God says, let there be light. And what happens when God says, let there be light? There was light. There was light. God said, let there be a rakia. There was a rakia. God said, let the land bring forth. The land brought forth. Uh, we're actually going to have a, a whole discussion of the firmament, you know, like what in the world does that thing uh, mean? Uh, Caleb? Yes. That, that is exactly right. So God says, let there be light. There was light. And God says, don't commit adultery. And so none of us ever sexually sinned, right? Didn't? God says, don't devalue other people. So none of us devalue other It's like, okay, this is weird. God speaks, and it's so. But with us, God speaks. And, you know, are you sure you need 10? Would you settle for 8? Could I do 5.5? You know, 
And so there's this weird thing going on. If Genesis 1 is creating a, a tabernacle, it's really weird that people are the only ones who don't do what God says. God speaks other things into creation, but people, and he allows people, um, he has more than enough power to make people do what he wants, but he allows people not to do what he says. And so I imagine you find that, uh, and you very insightfully uh, found that there's a difference between inanimate things and then people who God has given uh, unforced free will. That's interesting. Which is interesting to me. What uh, what else uh, did you find interesting in the homework? Uh, did you find anything challenging in the homework, or confusing, or you read something and say, "Wow, I'm not sure I really get that." Uh, well, let's uh, let's dive in and look at some things. So, according to the Bible, what does it take for a person to live at peace with, with God in New Jerusalem slash restored Eden? So, if, if Genesis 1 is uh, picturing um, God creating uh, the universe as a heavenly tabernacle with with a separation, with seven lights, with special days, with uh, all this stuff, what does it take to live in that temple? Um, and when we step back and look at the whole Bible, what does it take to live in restored Eden? That is, this holy of holies that somehow in the Bible is this incredibly big cubic space, this city uh, of, of people who are uh, living in the immediate presence of God, what does it take? What does it take to live there? Uh, what does it take to drink coffee in that city, to uh, have guitar lessons in that city, to have conversation in that city, to, to have fellowship with this holy, holy God? What does it take? In the Bible is really clear what it takes. And this is what the Bible says. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So whatever this city is, we know who we know the kind of people who are not there, and that's these type people. And hold your question because we've got a lot of uh, slides and then we'll take questions to, uh, toward the end. Ephesians 5 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. People are going to try to convince you of this, that you can live with God in heaven and, and be these things. But Paul says, don't let anybody convince you of that because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. So if this heavenly city is pictured as this lovely woman, this uh, woman who has somehow become a temple and, and will have intimacy with God, this woman's going to be pure in heaven. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. 
The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Hebrews 12, 14, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness. Strive for holiness. And without that holiness, no one will see the Lord. Or Jesus himself, blessed are the pure in heart because they're the ones who are going to see God in heaven. So what are people in heaven like? Well, it tells us at the end, as for cowardly, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, all liars, their portion will be the lake that burns with fire. That's the second death. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. And in the Greek, this is spelled out uh, in such a graphic way, I can't even, it would be difficult for me in polite company to translate it exactly as it is in Greek, but it's describing two consensual adults, uh, and it says those will not inherit nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul, to a sexually plagued church in Corinth, says, such were some of you. But you were justified, you, you were washed, you were sanctified. Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, I tell you, unless your righteousness unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so that's what this lecture is about today. It's like, okay, you've, you've read those uh, uh, passages, and it's like, okay, uh, do, do any of those things apply to you, you know? Uh, are you perfect enough to live with God in heaven? And I hope at this point in the uh, uh, the discussion that in your own mind you think, well, I am so headed to hell. Um, I sin every day in thought, word, and deed. Those descriptions are descriptions of my fallen flesh. And if I'm going to live in restored Eden, it says people like me can't be there. How do we put this together? And that's what we're going to look at today. Um, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments. We're going to look at these uh, creation statements. Does We're going to look at the question, does the Bible really imply that the people in heaven are perfectly obedient to God? And if so, how does the meta-narrative work. So we've got a lot on our plate. I'm unequal to the task. Let's dive in and see. Okay, so this is something that we really need to understand, and I'm going to try to explain it to you. And uh, so this is what the statement says. Uh, Moses wrote the tablets, on the tablets, the words of the covenant the words of the covenant, and then it says this, the Ten Commandments. And when you see the Ten Commandments in the ESV, what is this right here? What do you notice? That, like if you have a paper Bible and you read this verse in the ESV and it has, what is that? It's a footnote. And what should we do? Look at the footnote. And the footnote is going to tell us that in Hebrew, the words Ten Commandments 
are actually 10 words. So this is just the word, the words, and this is the word 10. So uh, the 10 commandments in Hebrew are called the 10 words, the 10 things that God said. So in Hebrew, it isn't called the 10 commandments. It's called the 10 words. Now, there are lots of 10s in the Bible. God uses 10 words to create the universe. We're going to see that in a second. God uses 10 words to establish the covenant at Sinai. Yom Kippur, the most important day in the Jewish calendar, the day of covering is on the 10th day of the first month. On the 10th day of the seventh month, you take the Passover lamb in. Daniel has 10 horns. There are 10 toes uh, there are 10 generations from Adam to Noah. There are 10 generations from Noah to Abraham. There seems to be something in the Bible going on with these tens. And so the question that a lot of people ask is, is there a connection between the creation of the universe and these 10 words at Mount Sinai? And... Uh, a very good teacher uh, of the Old Testament, um, man who could volume read uh, Hebrew, uh, wonderful teacher, John Salehammer. This is his wonderful note on this connection. It has already been noted that the creation account of Genesis 1 has been composed to foreshadow the giving of the covenant at Mount Sinai. One of the clearest indications of this is the pattern of the ten words, just as the whole covenant could be stated as ten words, the uh, Eseret Hadevarim, so too the whole universe could be created by ten statements from God, Vayomer Elohim, and God said. And then he spells out uh, what those are. Now, I don't know if you're a visual learner or not. I am. I read a thing like that, and I've got to go to the text and see it for myself. And so, believe it or not, uh, this was probably a fun hour of my life, but I went through and I looked at the ten words of creation. I looked at the ten words in the flood in judgment. I looked at the ten words called the Ten Commandments. And I looked at the ten plagues. I'm not sure this one is right. Um, I see how they get there. I'm not sure. But I do see this one that every single time it's the same, Vayomer Elohim, Vayomer Elohim, Vayomer Elohim, until God gets to people and then it adds the words to them. God said to them. But it's enough of a pattern that it makes me think there's something to this, that there's a connection between God giving the ten words at Sinai and God creating the world. So here's our question. If the people in heaven are righteous, holy people, how can I hope to live in heaven with a righteous, holy God when I sin every single day? How, how can somebody like me get there if people who are living in the Holy of Holies uh, aren't sinning sexually, aren't lying, aren't uh, doing the, the whole gamut of sins that all of us do uh, every single day in thought, word, and deed? Look at the text. This is more reason to connect these two ideas. On the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work. In Hebrew, that verse is exactly the same, part of that verse is exactly the same as this verse, so Moses finished the work. And this verse is 
talking about Moses uh, erecting the tabernacle. So God does the ten words and and the universe is there, and then Moses uh, outlines the commandments for the tabernacle, and when he finishes, uh, he has the exact same phrase from uh, Genesis uh, 2. So think about this with me. If you were a sinner, you know, uh, if you were a sinful person, you can't go here. You're excluded. And if you're a Jewish man, you can go here, but that's as far as you can go. And if you're a regular priest, you can go here, but that's as far as you can go. And then there's this veil with cherubs, and the high priest can go there, but he only once a year on the 10th day of the first month, Yom Kippur. So if you're sinful, uh, you're excluded. And they're all sinful, and we're all sinful. So who are the excluded people? Cowardly, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, idolaters, all liars. They're out here. We want to get here. How do, we, how do we do that? How is the Bible helping us with that? Well, remember this veil? When we did the tabernacle uh, study, you remember that on this veil are cherubs, right? And what do cherubs do? The one command that cherubs do after Adam and Eve sin, what's their one commandment? Their one commandment is to keep sinful people out of the Garden of Eden, right? So when Jesus died on the cross, it tells us the veil in the temple was torn in two. What, are, what is on that veil? Cherubs. Okay, this, whatever this book is about, it's about getting people back to this cubic holy of holy, this restored Garden of Eden, and it's somehow connected with Jesus' death. Now, in the first tabernacle, there was a provision made for an accidental sin. There is no provision made for an on-purpose sin where you just say, I know this is what God's law says, but I'm just going to do. There's no provision for that anywhere in the Old Testament. If you do an accidental sin, it spells out what you can do, and a priest has to come, take your offering, uh, offer it, uh, can cleanse you, and can maybe get you here, but here's not where we want to be. We want to be all the way in the Holy of Holies. In the Old Testament, accidental sins could be um, dealt with, but not on purpose sins. And I don't know about you, but what plagues my conscience is not accidental sins. It's just when I'm too sorry to do what I know is right. Caleb. Uh, we're going to see the beautiful, I think we're going to see the beautiful meta narrative connection. Uh, what David, this sinful man is doing and what why we as sinful people can have hope look at these verses for our sake he made him who knew no sin that's jesus to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of god So 
I want you to compare and contrast with me the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant. So this is going to be an important verse. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he will live by them. I am the Lord. So this is the whole idea, just like Adam in the garden. If you follow the rules, you get to stay in. If you don't follow the rules, you get kicked out. God is saying in the Mosaic Covenant, it's like that. These are my ten rules. They're not unreasonable. You know, don't murder anybody. Don't mess up somebody's family. Let me be God. They're reasonable rules. And if a person does them, they'll live by them. Now, I'm just looking over the class. Has anyone in this class uh, taken Hebrew or does anyone know? Uh, Hebrew. Um, well, good news. You've got a friend today who knows Hebrew. Uh, and this word that's translated a person who does it is the word ha, the word the, and then this word adam. The what is it? The Adam who does this will live. Huh. Okay, I'm recognizing that the tabernacle is the Garden of Eden. I'm recognizing this promise that if the Adam does these very reasonable things, then that Adam gets to flourish. But I'm not that Adam because I love sin. My flesh loves sin. How can the Bible give me hope? How can the Bible get me from here to here? Moses writes, Paul reads our verse. Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law that the person who does the commandments will live by them. Okay, you want to get there? Okay, pretty easy. Just do the Ten Commandments. You can live peacefully with God. God offered the deal to Adam, you know, Procreate to your heart's content. Do whatever, just don't break this one rule. And now he's saying, look, you can live in Eden, but these are the ten words. This is, this is what I, I want people to conf be conformed to if they live with me forever. Paul says, we know that the law is spiritual. There's nothing wrong with the law that says don't murder anybody. That's kind of a good thing, right? Be kind of a good idea. You're going, just don't murder anybody. And hey, don't murder anybody's marriage by messing with their spouse. Is, is, is that a bad law or is that like a good law? Don't lie to people. Don't be mad if somebody has good things from God, and it seems like you have different things. That seems like pretty reasonable requests for God to have people live with him in pleasure. And Jesus reiterates that. And he says, therefore, you must be perfect. How perfect? as your heavenly Father is perfect. And I see that and say, okay, I recognize that the law is reasonable, but I have a problem. My flesh loves sin. I have been in love with sin from the moment I was conceived. 
My parents didn't sit me down and say, this is how you be selfish. I was selfish the moment I was conceived. I was plagued with sin. My family has been plagued with sin. And I'll bet if God grants any of us a moment of honesty, we would all say, you know, that's true. These laws are reasonable, but I have a problem in that I can't live at peace with a holy God. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So what I'm trying to get at in this discussion is this question, how can a sinful person live with a holy God? How do I understand the Mosaic Covenant? How do I understand the New Covenant? These are reasonable requests. Love God. God is the best thing that exists in the universe, and God loves the truth. And so he says, people who live with me are going to recognize the truth that God's worthy of love. And here's the other truth. You know, love other people. Treat other people as they deserve to be treated. Created in the image of God. So what we have in the Bible are four places where there's perfect obedience to God. Eden, the Mosaic Covenant, do this and live. Jesus, as the new Adam, and he could say, yet not my will, but your will be done. And then the eschaton. In the Bible, in Eden, we have two innocent people. They have no sin nature, but they don't love God enough to obey him perfectly. So the story of the Bible is God making a new couple. But the difference is they love God so much that they're going to live with him at peace in heaven. It's not that they can't sin. It's that they won't sin. The story of the Bible is how, how does that happen to people? And the Bible gives us a great uh, understanding in that it compares the first Moses with the new Moses, Jesus. Look at this. When Moses was born, he was the deliverer. And what did the king try to do to destroy the deliverer? He killed children. And in the New Testament, when the ultimate deliverer was born, what did the wicked king try to do? He tried to kill children. God says, children are made in my image. How dare you harm a child? And Pharaoh, who was so wealthy and so sophisticated and had so much science on his side that they could plot the position of stars, were so wicked that they killed children. And we see in the New Testament with Herod and he has so much wealth and he's building a temple and, and he's doing all this thing, but he has murder in his heart and he murders innocent children. And God says, that matters to me. Those children are made in my image. I care. We see that Moses goes to the top of a mountain and expounds the law. And in Matthew 5, Jesus goes to the top of a mountain and expounds the law. This is the mountain Moses went up, a deadly looking desert place uh, called Mount Thorns or Mount Destruction in Hebrew. This is the mountain Jesus went up to expound the law. Moses led the people on an exodus out of slavery to sin into a land flowing with milk and honey. 
Jesus, it says when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah appeared to him and they spoke to him about his exodus, which bafflingly the ESV translates departure. Why in the world would you do that? Why not just put exodus? If you did it, exodus, a child could connect those stories. If you do it, departure, nobody can connect the stories. Translate the word that's there, not the word, sorry, I'm on a soapbox, forgive me. Uh, the whole story is how do we get back to the Garden of Eden, this Garden of Pleasure, this uh, cubic place. How do we get back there if we've got this sin problem? The whole story, God is making little God lovers. He wants little God lovers and wants the whole world filled. And the problem is they die spiritually. So how is he going to get little God lovers back in Eden? Moses failed to bring the people in to the land. And he failed because he disobeyed the law. He could only take them to Abel Shatim, to the field of thorns, until this really cool guy came along whose name was Iasus. And Iasus took the people out of the field of thorns into the land flowing with milk and honey. And the New Testament says this really cool guy named Iasus, by a single offering, oh, here's some hope, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Look at the beauty of that. Has perfected for all time those who are being made holy. Now, if the text says they're being made holy, they're being made holy, what does that imply? Are they perfectly holy now? Oh, that's the good news, because I'm not perfectly holy now, right? But this says those who are being sanctified, that by a single offering, he has perfected for all time. So people who are struggling with sin, who are struggling with sexual sin, who are struggling with uh, lying, who are struggling with uh, substance abuse, who are struggling with not loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's good news for people like that because Jesus, as the perfect high priest, has perfected for all time those who right now are being sanctified from their sin. Paul says this, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You're trying to get back to the Garden of Eden. How do you get there? It's not Moses. It's the new Moses. It's the new Joshua who can take you into the land flowing with milk and honey. The New Testament authors understood Jesus to be the culmination of the Old Testament. He's the last Adam, the true Israel, the suffering servant, the son of David, the faithful remnant, the ultimate prophet, the ultimate priest, the ultimate king. The kingdom of God is God's people and God's place under God's rule. And that kingdom requires perfect obedience. And you see how the kingdom of God is reduced to a person, God's people, God's place under God's rule. And the New Testament is saying those who connect with Jesus are part of this, this cosmic priesthood that's going on where by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, those who are being made pure from their sin 
story of the Bible is how do you go beyond the cherubs into the Holy of Holies? Just as Moses gave God's law at Sinai, Jesus enables Christians to begin to stumblingly and imperfectly obey God's law at Pentecost, 50 days, the same day Moses got the law. And then Jesus grants Christians at death that ultimate transformation to make them just when men and women having been made perfect. This makes Jesus the guarantee of a better covenant. It isn't do this and live. It's Jesus by one sacrifice has perfected for all time those who now in this life are being made holy. That's why Jesus can say, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Those who are being saved are the people who recognize I cannot get into the Holy of Holies like I am now. My heart is sick. My flesh is rotten. I could never live with a holy God. But I have a priest who offered a single sacrifice who has perfected for all time those who are being made holy. In my office, I have a carving on my wall and it's uh, this passage. I think it's Luke 18.13 and it says, O God, O God, be made merciful. I can't make you merciful to me, but be made merciful by this sacrifice. Be made merciful to me. And then, I don't know why in the world English translations do this. A sinner. Anybody who's taken Greek knows that this says the sinner. God, be made merciful to me, the sinner. The sinner of all sinners. Be made merciful by the sacrifice of Christ. I can't fulfill the law. Jesus has fulfilled the law. Jesus did love the Lord his God. Jesus did love his neighbor as himself. And Jesus is bringing me out of the land of slavery into the land flowing with milk and honey because he is the new Adam, knows how to live perfectly with God, and he's willing to share that with me when I recognize my bankruptcy before God. Well, I see we've run out of time. Um, We're going to talk about more of this, uh, but I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Monday.